Um, but remember, if, all, if we only did that, we would still only have an approximation. So the other thing this does is take the limit as the approximation gets better and better. So this means take the sum and take the limit of that sum as the approximation gets better and better, which means smaller and smaller areas. As we're taking smaller and smaller areas, the electric field gets closer and closer to being constant over each area. So as you take smaller and smaller areas, this approximation gets better and better. So the limit of all those approximations is the exact answer. So this is a very clever and not obvious trick um, that the mathematicians and physicists have come up, for, come up with for dealing with variables that are changing. They take a very small amount of area where the variable is approximately constant um, to figure out a bunch of approximate changes in the dependent variable. Then they add those all up to get a approximate total amount for the dependent variable. And then if you take the limit, um, as the approximations get better and better, well, the limit of all those approximations is the exact answer. And the nice thing about this integral sign is it means two things. It means add up all the approximations and take the limit as they get closer and closer. So the, um, the integral of all these approximate small fluxes is the exact total flux. Well, the next thing we should do is, where, what are all these small fluxes? All these small fluxes, remember, come from this formula. So this formula turns into this. And again, all we're saying is, take a bunch of tiny little areas where the field is approximately constant, and that will give you um, an, a good approximation for what the total amount of flux is, if you add up all those approximations and take the limit as the approximations get better and better. And in calculus, Excuse me. In calculus, we learned easy ways to take these integrals. So that even though it seems like a very complicated symbol, we have shortcuts that allow us to take this integral quite quickly. So this is the general formula for electric flux. This formula is only the electric flux when you have a constant E. This is the general formula for the electric flux when E is changing. So uh, when E is changing, you want to use this formula for the electric flux. I spent some time trying to explain the logic here because you can actually need this for a bunch of other concepts as the course goes on now too. You'll have a bunch of formulas that will only work when one of the variables is constant and you need to generalize them using integration. So we just said this is the formula that you use in general for flux when E can be changing. Let's say that we start with this formula for flux and then you learn that actually E is constant. How would this formula simplify if E was constant? Well, Let's see what we remember about integration from your calculus course. If you know that this is a constant, do you know what you can do to simplify this integral? You can pull it out from the integral. Right. You can take constants out of an integral. So then that would give us this. Now this only works if you know that E is constant. If E is, not, if e is changing, you have to stick with this. But if E is constant, you could do this. Well, now, what, does, what is this? Well, remember what they we're doing here is these are all the, the small amounts of area. But what would happen if you sum up all the small amounts of area? Well, if you add up all the small, amount of, small amounts of area, what do you get? You get the total area. Mm -hmm. So if E was constant, you would get this formula, which stands to reason because we knew that was the formula for constant E all the time. Uh -huh. So I just wanted to show that this is totally consistent with what we saw before. Okay. Now, this is what's going to happen to you a lot. You're expected to know about this formula for this course. However, the vast majority of problems you do are actually going to have constant E's, because otherwise, usually, the math gets too hard. Yeah. But you're expected still to start here and get this formula by pulling the E out of the integral. Okay. All right, so you're expected to know this formula, but usually, you're going to end up using this formula. All right, and uh, I've been kind of assuming that E was parallel to the A vector here, because I haven't been focusing on cosine theta. Or we could just say that these are all dot products. So we could say these are all dot products. So you might uh, have to take the dot product. You might have to take the cosine theta as well. Although, again, remember in this course, almost always theta is going to be 0 or 180. Usually, it's just going to be uh, parallel or anti-parallel to the normal to the surface. OK, so this is the general formula. But this is the formula we're usually going to end up using to solve problems.
So let's say we have a sphere. This is a closed sphere, so there's material everywhere in this sphere. Um, so this is a filled-in sphere. And let's say that we have a charge of Q that is spread uniformly through this sphere. Let's say the sphere has a radius of capital R. So we have a uniformly charged sphere. So it's got a total charge of Q spread out through the entire sphere. Remember, I can only draw a circle, but you should imagine that this is extending into and out of the board as well. And the problem is to find the electric field at all points in space. All right, well, let's work through this together, and this will give us an example of how to use Gauss's law. We want to find the electric field at all points in space. So let's start by trying to find the electric field over here. Uh, and we'll see how we're going to do that. Well, we're going to, um, one thing we can't do, we can't just use our old formula KQS over R squared, because remember that was for point charges, and this is not a point charge anymore. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to show how we can use Gauss's law in this situation. Okay. Well, remember, this is Gauss's law. Well, the first thing we're going to have to do is draw the Gaussian surface. Remember that this whole concept here of flux is based on having a closed surface and counting how many electric field lines are exiting it. So we have to start by drawing the Gaussian surface. Uh, so let's go ahead and draw that Gaussian surface. Well, we need to draw the Gaussian surface through the point that we're focusing on. Well, I've decided arbitrarily to focus on this point. So we have to draw a Gaussian surface through that point. We have to decide what's the right shape to draw. There's many different shapes we could draw. We could draw a pyramid, um, we could draw a cube, many different shapes. Well, the key is Gauss's law is most useful when you draw something symmetrical, something that is symmetrical with respect to the source charge. So we want to try to draw a, a surface through here that will be symmetrical with respect to the source charge. Uh, we'll see in a second why that's useful. Well, can you think what type of shape, what type of surface could we draw through this point that would be symmetrical to our source charge? For example, one thing we could do is we could try to just draw a box. Oh, you mean like drawing a circle around yeah. another sphere? Around That's sphere. right. Okay. So we might draw a sphere or a pyramid um, or many different things. Well, we could think of doing a box, but I just wanted to mention that to reject it. Why would a box be bad? Because it's not really symmetrical with respect to here. For example, this point over here is further from the uh, source charge than this point. Well, we'd like everything here to be the same distance from the source charge. That's what, how we get the maximum amount of symmetry. Okay. So a box wouldn't work very well in this situation. Um, so what shape would work well? A sphere. Yeah, a sphere. Uh -huh. uh, that kind of makes sense. Since we have a spherical source charge, the way to be symmetrical with this is to draw a sphere around it. Okay. Now, notice that we wouldn't want to draw, say, this sphere. Because this is not symmetrical with respect to the source charge. It's all on one side of the source charge. We want to draw a sphere all the way around the source charge. And the source charge is that smaller sphere, the whole thing? Yeah. Okay. The source charge is this whole big ball of uh, charge. Okay. Remember that we're imagining this is a filled-in ball of charge. Maybe, uh, it's a, yeah, so a sphere means a filled-in ball. I remember you said that last week. But I can kind of shade it like this to show that there's material everywhere. So here's the Gaussian surface. I'm not a very good drawer, but this is supposed to be a circle. So that's supposed to be a symmetrical circle. Uh, and again, it's unfortunate that I, it, um, it's actually not a circle. It's a sphere. Yeah. You have to imagine that this is also extending out of the board and into the board. All I can do is draw the two-dimensional cross surface. But Gaussian surfaces, for Gauss's law, always have to extend into and out of the board. 
So all we can do is draw their two-dimensional cross-section. Now, this really is symmetric with respect to this source here. So this is the best surface that we could draw. We're taking advantage here of the spherical symmetry. And now we're going to try to use our Gauss's law. 